So this is our last discussion for the course, and obviously we'll be talking about the 1990s, but we also will uh, talk for a couple of minutes about really wrapping up the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, and I know that some of you have discussed how Harrison's book um, is not necessarily an easy read, and, and it is not an easy read, um, but it is definitely something that you can skip around in and sort of pick out what he has to say about American culture. And, and again, remember that I, I had you watch the Peter Jennings video so that you could get a very basic narrative about the 1990s too, because obviously Harrison doesn't, doesn't do it that well. Um, there is a new book that's coming out, if any of you are interested, and it's the book that I wanted to use for this course because I had read it, but I had read an advanced copy and actually didn't know it, so I didn't know that it, it wasn't coming out until October 9th. But it's a book by Gil Troy, and it's, it's a very historically based book about the age of Clinton. So it would have fit in really, really well with the other three books that, that we've read for the course, and especially in terms of the connections between the age of Reagan and the age of Clinton. So keep that in mind if that's something that you want to want to further delve into um, after the course. But Harrison's book, I believe, is very good in terms terms of discussing how important culture is in the 1990s. And the reason why I picked the book is because that dovetails so well with the 1960s, right? And obviously, as many of you have already figured out, my thesis for, for really the entirety of the course is that by the time we get to the 1990s, you know, a lot of these issues that people thought were lying dormant, a lot of these issues that, that people believed were not being worked on were sort of incrementally being worked on after the backlash in, in 1968. And so we see that diversity is inching along. We see that anti-discrimination is inching along. Um, and we see that by the early 1990s, you have a great diversity in culture. And even though we see with the LA riots that obviously uh, racial inequity is, is, uh, hasn't been taken care of, um, we certainly understand that there are a great deal of racial tension. So all of those things are, are underlying. And that's probably one of the reasons why we would have wanted many of these issues out in the open so we could have continued to work on them out in the open and particularly in mainstream society. But the recognition here for the 1990s is that even though we have these racial issues that are going on, even though we have gender issues that will be going on as well, by the time you move into the 1990s, American culture is really multicultural, right? It's not this mainstream sort of white society that, that we had seen in the early 1950s, the mid-1950s, the, mid, uh, the late 1950s, rather. And then as we moved into the 1960s, this idea of that somewhat changing. So maybe the dream of the 1960s didn't work in the 1960s, but by the time we get to the 1990s, a good chunk of that dream has been fulfilled, at least in my eyes. Now, once again, I will add the caveat that racial issues are clearly still there. They're still there in the 1990s. They're still there in in uh, um the early 2000s, and they're certainly still around now. But we can certainly see that there's a vast difference between 1955 and 1995. And so that's what I'm trying to push here, because I don't believe in a post-racial society. I don't believe in a post-gender society either. Um, I really believe that, that we have a lot more to work on. But we can certainly see historically that there's a vast change between what we were talking about at the beginning of this course and what we're talking about at the end of the course. So if you're sort of searching around for Harrison's thesis um, in terms of the 1990s, I certainly believe that it's on page three and it's about this idea of heterogeneity. So the idea of, of America being diverse, there being great diversity in culture, diversity in society, and that things are obviously quite different than they were in the 1950s. And so that's what Harrison is arguing, that there's a heterogeneity about American society and American culture by the time we're in the 1990s. Diversity, diversity, diversity. And so that's really what he's trying to prove with his book. And his book, again, is very much based in culture, so it's going to be talking a lot about movies and literature, 
going to be talking about music a lot the way that I do, uh, but he doesn't have that background. Um, he doesn't talk a lot about politics. Um, he doesn't talk a, a lot about what's going on economically. That's somewhat peppered in there as long as it connects to culture, right? So let's talk about one of the things that he discusses in the introduction of the book, which are the four main narratives that he sees in terms of the 1990s. Now, these would be the narratives not, not put out there by historians, um, but by a variety variety of scholars and also in terms of how the American public views the 1990s. I personally as a historian would see all of these narratives fitting together. Um, so I think you could, uh, if you were going to try and make some sort of a thesis yourself for the 1990s, I think you could fit all of these issues together. Um, the first main narrative he talks about are the Clinton years. So that's a very political narrative, right? So political history. Um, the Clinton years are a very interesting time because there's a great deal of hope at the beginning of the Clinton Clinton years, and then by the time we get to the end of the Clinton years, Clinton has has really um, created a situation for himself that makes a lot of people look back to the time of Watergate, um, and they stop trusting Bill Clinton, even though he had huge approval ratings before um, the Lewinsky scandal actually broke. So the Clinton years are are very interesting in that if we're talking about with the it's multifaceted if you're talking about politics because again we we've talked about you know the age of Reagan and we've talked about um George Herbert Walker Bush's presidency being somewhat linked to the age of Reagan I will often counter that because again I see them as being two vastly different types of Republicans but you can see some continuity there right but we see this huge about face when we see Bill Clinton come in and so you can obviously talk about political changes and we've talked about you know moving from liberalism to conservatism and back to liberalism and then back to conservatism and that's certainly a, a political narrative in terms of uh, the late 20th 20th century. Uh, but you can also see the Clinton years as, again, sort of a culmination of the 1960s in terms of sort of the hopes of liberalism and then Bill Clinton being able to make some of those things happen and also not be able to make many other things happen, uh, particularly, say, gays in the military, because of the fact that he's a Washington outsider and really doesn't know how to step into Washington and be a very strong political player. Now, he learns the game quite fast, but it takes him a, a little while to understand, you know, what is it that I, what, what envelopes can I push here? Um, and so it takes him a little bit to figure that out. And it takes him, I think, a longer period of time to figure out that he can't just order the American public to accept something and they'll do so. Um, even though he had high approval ratings, even though uh, um, he considered himself to be a popular choice, uh, for, for many Americans, they just because they liked him and just because they voted him as, in as president, doesn't necessarily mean that they were going to accept everything that he said. And also, Clinton was not someone who was who was popular across the board. There, there were not a lot of Republicans who were going to be crossing party lines to vote for Bill Clinton, at least in 1992. It's very different in 1996, but in 1992, it's a little different. So you can see multiple narratives running here. You can see the scandal narrative that's going to run in here, too. So the Clinton years, I would suggest, is, is a... Um, a facet of the narrative of the 1990s. Another facet would be significant economic expansion. Um, there, the economic expansion and the economy somewhat wax and wane throughout the 1990s. But we definitely see a surge in the, uh, uh, I would say, around 93, 94. Um, and then you certainly see a surge in the American economy during the late 1990s, especially around 97, 98, when information technology is taking off. And people make a bundle of money in the stock market, but the stock market then plummets after they they make that bundle of money. So we've talked a lot about the cyclical nature of uh, the economy. I would suggest that the 1990s, the economy really goes, it starts down, trends up, trends back down, trends up again, and then somewhat plummets. So it's definitely something that, that for the American public it would be a significant um, 
narrative for them because especially in 1992 when the unemployment rate was high and they believed that George Herbert Walker Bush could have done something for them in terms of the economy, in terms of getting their jobs back, in terms of maybe even being able to uh, recapture middle class status if they've fallen below uh, uh, the middle class. So the economic narrative is really there, but the economic narrative is also there for people who are interested in financial markets and they're interested in how financial markets change and again information technology the information age technology is really going to uh, boost the uh, the economic system of the United States but it will also put it on uh, very much of a roller coaster as well so you can see how that narrative fits in as well the information age I would suggest is a a significant part of the narrative of the 1990s we see in the 1890s that there's a significant change in the way people communicate, a significant change in the way that people travel throughout the United States, right? So you have people that by, by the uh, 1890s, after the creation of the railroad systems in the 1860s and 1870s, that you see by the 1890s that people are using it as a form of transportation to move through the United States. And so we see some, some significant cultural and social changes that occur then. And then we also see that people are communicating via the telegraph and then eventually by telephone. And so we really see that, that the world is changing around them. And remember, we've talked about the fact that as the world changed, changed around them, they got very scared, right? Well, this is the same thing that's going to happen in the 1990s. The information age is great, and if you're young enough, it's probably not going to be something that, that frightens you. But if you're old enough, it does frighten you. The world is changing around you. Sometimes you can't keep up with the way the world's changing around you, especially an elderly person in terms of the information age. So this information age is not only going to change how the world works around you, it's going to change how your daily life works. And for some people, that can be very scary. And for other people, it can be the most exhilarating thing in the world. So in terms of information technology, we can definitely see that, you know, by the time we get into the early 2000s, and especially by, by 07, 08, 09, when people are, are grabbing up smartphones, we certainly see how much the, the technology or information technology age has changed us. But if you were old enough to remember and to understand how in 96, 97, 98 that people started getting the internet in their home, that that's really going to change the way people live their daily life. And by the early 2000s, everything has changed. Obviously, email has taken over as a main mode of communication, then texting will as well. But it's really an age where people's daily lives. It's not just the outside world, but your daily life is changing too. So that's a significant narrative for, for not only the United States, but also the rest of the world. But what also happens in the 1990s is that we also see this narrative of the end of times. And Harrison talks a lot about the 1990s, and I talk a lot about the 1990s as being sort of a transitional period. Um, it's another one of those bridges, because remember we talked about the 80s somewhat being a bridge, right? The 80s being a bridge between the 70s and the, and the 90s. But the 90s are really this bridge between this old century and this new century. And so the 90s really serve as, as this place where we're navigating the old and the new at the same time. We're navigating the past and the present and the future at the same time. And one of the things that people think a lot about in terms of the future is will the world end? Because we're not just moving into a new century, we're moving into a new millennium. And so moving into into that new era for people is very, very scary. And for some people, they try to label it as excitement, that they're very excited and this is a new age and we're going to party and this is, you know, turning from 1999 to 2000 is the best thing ever. But even those people who are thinking that have an underlying fear about what it really means to move from 1999 to the year 2000. And so there are, you know, there are all of these old folk tales that people bring up and there are all of these biblical tales that people bring up. And it's really this, this underlying discussion of, is it the end of times? And what does this mean, obviously, as a human being? If it's the end of times, what does this mean for me?
And so there is a little bit of anxiety in the end of the 1990s. And I would suggest that what we see in terms of culture in the 1990s, there's a very significant difference between the early 1990s and the late 1990s in terms of culture, whether it's films or, or uh, television shows or music particularly, that we're going to see that by the end of the 1990s, people are really going to be focused a lot on, on good times and not really digging too deep into things and not really thinking about issues as much as as they typically do and just sort of trying to try to wide or, or ride rather the wave into the uh, 21st century and so it is a time of, of of anxiety and there are things obviously that happen in the 1990s that create anxieties too so say the racial tensions in the early early 1990s or the uh, trust issues with the president of the United States in the late 1990s so there are a variety of anxieties that are going to be out there but this idea of of the end of times or the possible end of history is really going to be something that 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 it's it's going to be something that influences how people walk through the last few years of the 1990s now I have a question here in terms of is this too soon and what I mean by that is a lot of historians who who study um, who do not study the modern era and that really whether they're they're uh, um, Americanists or Europeanists or whatever it is that they study but they study things that are that are well before 1950 and they often study things that are well before 1900 and so Often when you get into history where you're talking about the 60s, the 70s, absolutely the 80s, absolutely the 90s, and certainly the 2000s, is that historians don't always think that it's time to be studying that. Now, I'm somebody who thinks very, very differently. Um, it's hard for me to teach sometimes in terms of giving people supplemental materials because a lot of historians are not into the idea of, of creating historical periods out of things that are less than 25 years old. But for me, it really helps for whether you're a historian, if you're a student, if you're just a, a plain old American that wants to understand the history of the country. If you're not talking about the recent past, then you're not really going to understand the present, right? So I always talk in other courses about being able to take things, say, like the progressive era in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, and how does that connect to the 21st century? How does it connect to your day today? But we can already see here that I've talked about the issue of technology and the progressive era was a a reform movement that really was a response to the changes of the age so the changes of the late 19th and early 20th century when we see some significant changes that are going to be occurring in the late 20th century well, obviously, in the early 21st century, there's going to be at least some sort of backlash to it or some sort of reform or a full embrace of it. For us, it happened to actually be a full embrace of what of what was going on. There are still people there that they call themselves Luddites who say, I don't want a, a smartphone. I don't want the Internet in my house. I don't watch Netflix. I don't do that. And they, they're not interested in having a Kindle. And there are plenty of people who do that. But on a whole and in mainstream culture, most people really really embraced how technology was changing their lives. But do you see how in being able to study the 1990s, we have again a bridge here between the, the past of say the late 19th century, early 20th century, and then we have the current history that we are walking through right now. And so it creates that bridge and it really allows us to understand how everything fits together and it certainly helps us to understand how the world works today. But Harrison brings this up and I will bring it up to you too that there are many people out there that think it's just too close to us, that we can't really understand the 1990s uh, until we get maybe at least 10, 20, or maybe even 30 years further away from them. Um, I would suggest that probably the history would get better as we study it more and more, but everything gets better after you after you delve in, into it more and examine it more. I'm not one who believes in the idea that, that you're too close to it or you lived through it so you, you uh, um, have some sort of a bias to it. I actually think if you've lived through it, this is the reason why people do oral histories, if you you live through it you really get a sense of what it was like to be there and so I think that that's interesting in terms of being able to discuss a recent era is to get your own voice in there something that you have have been able to experience 
so you are able to, in my estimation, better understand it. So I don't think it's too soon, but he raises the question, so I wanted to talk about that. I also will talk very quickly about the idea of the 60s in the 90s, and I've talked about it before when you read the Harrison book, and you've obviously seen it in the Harrison book, so that you see a lot of the 60s in the 90s. And one of the things that you definitely see is, as I talked about in the, in the main themes of last week, this idea that Bill Clinton really I I embodies how the 60s become a part of the 90s, right? And how that evolution of somebody from, who came of age in the 60s and who this person is in the 1990s. But we also see diversity issues. We also see cultural issues, uh, gender issues. All of these things that were in the 90s are going to come back, uh, or the 60s rather, is go they're all going to come back up in the 90s. So let's move forward a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about some of the conclusions that Harrison has, and then we will uh, discuss some of the major themes of the 1990s. So in Harrison's concluding chapter, he talks a great deal about what he sees as, as what the culmination is of, of the 1990s. What do the 1990s mean, right? And uh, I'll, I have the points that he lists in the book here on the slide, but I'm going to add a little bit to them as well as, as we move through them, just to sort of simply illustrate, you know, that, that, that there are many different ways that you can see the 1990s. And I want you to, you to understand how Harrison sees them and to understand how I see them, but you also need to be able to create for yourself your understanding of the 1990s and especially the importance of the 1990s and how the 1990s will fit in with the other decades that we've talked about. And that obviously will help you in terms of your final assignment. So Harrison does talk about the same thing that I had talked about in the previous slide about the impending millennium creating fear. Uh, he also suggests that the new millennium will create a desire for repetition. So wanting to go back in time, wanting to be able to do the same things over and over and over again, and to really have that comfort of knowing, you know, how life is going to be, or maybe reliving something from the past, this nostalgia. And I talk about nostalgia in terms of uh, um, my little essay that I did for uh, uh, movies for this week, um, that there really is an emphasis on on the past and sort of reliving things. And one way that people want to relive things is to be able to remember so they can remember um, their country's importance. So as a, as a person living in the United States, as a, as a citizen of the United States, how important the United States was between 1900 and 2000, right? The so-called American century. So there's a desire for that type of repetition, particularly nostalgia. Um, and Nostalgia is comfort, right? As, as long as it's, it's uh, good stuff that you're remembering, it's comfort. And, and uh, obviously human beings also have an immense capacity for um, finding nostalgia even the, in the most negative things, right? So that desire for repetition clearly has to has for most Americans at this point in time. I won't talk about, about other countries or other people around the world, but I would suggest that for Americans, the idea of repetition is to remind themselves of how important the United States has been because the United States is hanging on, on this edge here, right? It's, it's become the lone superpower in the world by the 1990s. Um, and it's really this concern of what's next, you know, is it up or is it down? Is it status quo? What is it? What's going to happen? And so this need for repetition is not only human based, it's also based in being an American who's sort of hanging on the edge of this American century. He also discusses the issue of hybridity and the idea that, that sort of putting things together, putting the old with the new, right? Putting the old old century with the new century, the old millennium with the new millennium, and really creating a, a hybrid world for yourself where you can step from one place to another. And I think that's an extremely human way of looking at things, right? It's a way of calming yourself, a way of seeing the, the future and being able to walk toward it while holding on to that past. And I think that's extremely important. Now, he has some closing points, meaning so sort of the where where is the stopping point in terms of not just the 20th century. I mean, he talks, I don't think he necessarily talks about it in terms of the larger 20th century. It's more about where do the 90s stop. Um, and for him, the 90s, 
you could see it in three different points, right? The World Trade Organization protests in Seattle in 1999, the 2000 election, or maybe the hubbub around the election, and then 9-11. Now, I'm not going to discuss these points too much. I would suggest that the World Trade Organization protests are probably not a a signal that the 1990s are over or the 20th century is over. They really didn't change much and on top of that they really were not that big of a deal. They were kind of a blip on the screen. And I think he might have been coming from his own bias in terms of that, in terms of wanting those those uh, WTO protests to be a little bit more important than they were. The 2000 election I think is important and for those of you who are politically minded, you can absolutely use this in terms of, of just the change in guard again, right? So we're flipping and flopping back and forth as Americans in terms of which party is in the White House, and here we flip to another one again. And so we have, and, and this is going to be a long era, just like the Clinton era. So the Bush era really is going to, to signify what particularly the 2000s mean for the United States. And so you could see that as a breaking point. You could also see that as a breaking point in terms terms of how the election was contested and so how there's there's sort of a break in terms of the electoral process where people become even more apathetic in terms of of the political process and so that could be as well and the 9-11 for many people really I mean if the 1990s weren't over with the 2000 election they're over by September 11th 2001 um, and I probably would suggest that for myself this would be my argument that um, you don't even though there's a change in guard in 2000 you don't really see any any super significant cultural changes or social changes immediately but man by the time you hit 9-11 not only is it just a watershed moment for humanity and, and, and for the international community, but it's going to change the way the world and the United States operates in this post 9-11 world, right? So it's a very different world on September 12th than it was on September 11th early in the morning. And so I think that if you look at 9-11 as this breaking point, as it closing off the 1990s, that it really even closes off that century um, and that we move into a very different world um, and we move into a world that is, is defined very much by 9-11, especially in terms of, of warfare. So I, I think that for the world and for the United States and also for humanity, it's a, it's a very special and important moment. Um, and it's a devastating moment, but it also has um, significant reverberations, both negative and positive, um, throughout the world. So again, I want you to, you know, these are my talking points, and I can, I can talk about them, and I can tell you how I see them fit into the narrative. But what is it that you see in terms of how the 1990s end? How does, how do... How do we move from away from the 60s through the 90s? What stops this period, this contemporary period that, that we've been talking about? So what, not only what, what stops the 1990s, but what is it that closes off the 60s to the 90s for you? And I think that's extremely important to recognize that we're really talking about these very particular decades, and we talk about how the 60s start, and we reach back just a little bit into the, uh, into the 50s to kind of explain it and understand it and continue contextualize it. Well, what about the 90s? Like, what do we need to contextualize the 90s in terms of the 2000s? Where do you see all of this, this breaking up? And again, how do you find the 60s through the 90s important for the present day. So I just want you to be able to see your own way through this in terms of the 90s. And many of you lived through through this, that you were aware of what was going on as you lived lived through these, these issues. And you can have your own personal history come into play here as well. And this is, again, where some historians get upset about people inserting their own opinion and I don't think it's opinion I mean there's a way of putting it out there that I guess it, it sounds like opinion but it's experience right it's your own personal experience it's your own personal understanding and so you use that in terms of, of figuring out where the 1990s stop where the 20th century stops right and and just kind of see how how this era between the 60s and the 90s what how do we get these bookend dates right how do we get, where's the start of the 60s, where's the end of the 90s, and, and, and 
you guys obviously have gone through the course to recognize where all of these decades begin and end, but what about here in terms of the 1990s when you can interject your own personal experience so I think that's that's very important and again I would close it off at 9-11 but if you know if I sat here and thought about it a little longer I could find another way to close them off right so just kind of pick what feels comfortable for you what feels right for you and what you can support and that's that's really where you want to move uh, uh, from there and then uh, Harrison talks about the legacy of the 1990s, and the legacy for him is immense change, so especially in terms of information technology, right? Like, we, we're not talking about it in terms of the things to come, uh, especially like with smartphones, right? But in terms of how information technology changes our life, there's immense change in the 1990s. There's also immense change, according to Harrison, in terms of cultural and society, um, that there really is this culmination of, of the 1960s. So there's the immense change as well. But I love that he talks about the idea of transition and that the legacy of the 1990s is transition. And it really is this, this transitional bridge, if you will, between the... 20th century and the 21st century. Um, it not only is a bridge between the 80s and the 2000s, but it's it's really bridging the gap between these these two different periods of time that for Americans, if we're just strictly speaking about this in terms of American history, that for Americans is is a transitional period for them. That. Th America in 1900 was very different from America in 2000. And how did we get from point A to point B? And are we going to be able to hold on to point B? And so it's this transitional period of not knowing what the future brings. And I think that that really is a legacy of, of the 1990s. It's a, it's a transitional period. And as you can see, I call it a bipolar period because the earlier portion of the decade is very different from the second portion of the decade. And I find I lived through the 90s, as many of you did. And I, you know, I was of age in the, in the 1990s, as some of you were. And I just kind of look at it as a very odd period of time. It was a very interesting period of time, but it was very different from anything I had experienced in my life thus far. And it was also very different from anything that I had read about in terms of history. Um, and the closest thing I can come to in terms of transitional periods, in terms of the, the 1990s, would be the 1890s. And you can really see that there's, again, that bridge that's going on between two different significant eras. It's the same thing that you see in the 1990s. So I think that the 90s are kind of, you know, they're, they're very different. They're very odd and they're very, um, so many things happen within the 1990s that in the moment seem so important. And then by the time we moved into the 2000s, they weren't important at all. Like the thing that was most important was information technology. Um, but many of the political issues that occurred really weren't all that important. You know, the Lewinsky scandal, was not nearly as important as the Watergate scandal. Um, obviously, the change in guard between the Democrats and the Republicans was a big deal, but we don't know how somebody like Bill Clinton or Al Gore, who would have been the, the, the president by the time we got to uh, September 11th, we don't know how, how he would have reacted to September 11th. Um, and in the moment, maybe he would have reacted in the very same way that, that uh, uh uh, George W. Bush had reacted, um, particularly in terms of the war on terror. We don't know. So I can't necessarily say that I that in terms of, of this period that I see a huge difference in terms of politics, right? We obviously see the difference in terms of policy, but what I mean is that you don't really see any of the things happening that happened in the 90s really being of significant effect in the 2000s except for international terrorism. So I think that it's it's extremely interesting to look at the 1990s and to see that there were a lot of, of things that people were really focused on and obsessed with in the 90s that really didn't amount to anything in the 2000s. So I think that's interesting as well. So that's the wrap up here of what Harrison talks about, especially his introduction and his conclusion. So now let's move along and talk about some of the main points and the main themes of the 1990s. Okay, so here are some of the main themes of the 1990s, and I'm sure that you saw some of these in the uh, Peter Jennings video, and then uh, obviously you've read about some of these 
in uh, the Harrison book, but this at least will give you um, a little bit of context in terms of what Harrison's talking about. And I do understand that you'd probably need a lot more context for this book than you did for the other books, right? Um, because he just doesn't, he's not, a, he's not historically minded, right? He's not looking at things in terms of giving context. He's just trying to prove very particular points about culture. So, first of all, obviously, the 1990s, is the, this is the last decade of the American century, as I've mentioned. So there's a significant focus on historical memory in the 1990s, uh, you know, looking back on this century, looking back on what it means for the United States to have been a part of this, this, this changing world and to have really created and carved out a place for itself in the world. You know, it's very interesting to be able to call the 20th century the American century. And so in the 1990s, there's this significant focus on looking back. And I mentioned nostalgia, right? This idea of looking at, at what the United States has accomplished, where it was at in 1900, where it's at as we move to the year 2000, and really what, what, you know, what happens in between? Like, what are the most important, most significant moments? And we see this in terms of, of movies, right? We see this with Saving Private Ryan. We see this with looking at, I, I, I mentioned in the movie section, Sleepless in Seattle. The Sleepless in Seattle, there's, there's this nostalgia in terms of music and the Great American Songbook and all the standards that are a part of that movie. So there's this constant focus on, you know, what what the last century meant and what it meant for for Americans. So you need to think about that as you move through the 1990s of how important this decade is and people thinking about where the United States came from and, and, and where it's sitting on the edge of this new century. Another main theme, obviously, of the uh, the 1990s is the election and the presidency of Bill Clinton. Um, it's an interesting presidency. He comes in with a lot of hope, uh, much like the Kennedy presidency, and there was a lot of, of connection between him and Kennedy. Kennedy, when people talked about him not only in terms of, of the uh, election cycle, but also during the inauguration, um, that, that, you know, here was this child of the 60s, someone who was very much inspired by, by John F. Kennedy, and now here he is the President of the United States. But Clinton's presidency really waxes and wanes in terms of the things that he's able to do. Um, and he's, he definitely, at the beginning of his presidency, is someone who thinks that he can walk in a lot like Jimmy Carter and can can change Washington and obviously Washington is called an establishment because it is well established right it is something that is um, very difficult to change and people become upset uh, within Washington if you walk in and especially you've been a governor not even not even a member of Congress um, you've been a governor and you're from Arkansas and you walk in there and you say I'm gonna I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna change that and you obviously get a lot of people even within your own party um, that that really buck what it is that you're trying to do so he has issues with with don't ask don't tell which is the discussion of you know he wants gays in the military and what he ends up with is don't ask don't tell so basically nothing really changes other than the fact that as long you can be gay in the military as long as you're not open about it and if people find out about it then you're kicked out so it really was not much of a much of a, a victory for for Clinton um, also his his uh, health care act um, he created a committee and and Hillary Clinton sat on the committee um, and it was to create uh, affordable health Health care for the United States, um, for the populace of the United States, and to uh, um, to have government subs subsidies for um, the insurance, and to create for people a universal health care plan in the United States, and it fails miserably. the The committee itself fails, and then obviously it's not something that anyone works on until you get to the Obama administration. But it was there. But Clinton had multiple failures policy-wise at the beginning of his term. One of the things that he doesn't fail on is foreign policy. Now, often he does have issues with humanitarian efforts, uh, but he is somebody who is a very good diplomat. Um, he is somebody who's able to create treaties and trade agreements. And, and uh, NAFTA is one of the shining moments of, of his uh, first presidency. So he's definitely someone who is able to... Um, 
have a few wins uh, and and to be able to put those in his column, um, but he really the, the his first his first term is is quite iffy, and his second term is going to be even even more iffy. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, Clinton's Clinton's poll numbers um, had gone down significantly um, in 1994 and early 1995. In 1994 is when you have the Republican Revolution, which is when, and this is historically something that happens anyway when there's a change in guard in terms of the uh, the presidency, um, is that typically the opposite uh, side of the uh, the aisle uh, takes the midterm elections. It's something that, that typically happens, but it really was something that the bold Clinton and over. Um, he had really thought that he had, you know, popularity in the can, right? And he really was somebody who, who thought that that transferred to his party. Um, and the Republican Revolution was really a backlash to um, the first years of his presidency. But in April of 1995, there's the Oklahoma City bombing. And the Oklahoma City bombing, obviously an act of domestic terrorism. And Clinton, it really is one of his shining moments. He goes down to Oklahoma City. Um, he attends memorial services. Um, he is able to be empathetic and sympathetic uh, toward the uh, uh, the people who were involved in the bombing, particularly the parents of the children who were killed in the bombing. He makes some wonderfully eloquent speeches um, that are carried on national television, and his poll numbers go through the roof. And this is something that obviously we want as Americans, as somebody who can lead us um, in a time of, of tragedy or in a time of significant conflict, right? And for Clinton, it's the tragedy aspect. And so his poll numbers really go up, and it really helps him in terms of the uh, um, the next election and, and winning his uh, his second term. And as, as uh, I mentioned in our overview, um, he's able to win even s uh, seriously conservative states like Arizona um, in terms of the popular vote. Um, and so he he is able to, in a very short period of time, really really raise his poll numbers. But then after um, he's in the White House in his second term for about a year, the Lewinsky scandal comes up. And obviously the Win Lewinsky scandal eventually fades away and fades into the background. Um, it's something that for a, a long period of time, a full year, um, there's a consistent focus on the uh, possible impeachment and then the actual impeachment of the president. Um, and would he be in acquitted of uh, of uh, um would he be acquitted of the things that he was, uh, um, the, the things w that were levied against him? What number one being perjury, um, and so for Clinton, it really is an era where he's he's sitting here in his second presidency. He thought that because of the immense popular vote that he got, um, the fact that he had won over some conservative states, he thought that he was going to be able to walk into this second term and just really have at it, right? You know, he's got four years under his belt. It's going to be a period of time when he, he has significant political capital. And he squanders a bit of it in the first in the first year. Um, but once the Lewinsky, Lewinsky scandal rather breaks, it is, it is you know, all out warfare on the president. You know, should he be kept in office? Should he be impeached? After he's impeached, will he be acquitted? Or, or is he going to be convicted? And if he's convicted, Convicted, obviously, that's the removal of the president. And the removal of the president, obviously, would be the first time in the nation's history where you would have the removal of a sitting president. Because remember, with Richard Nixon, he 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 decided that he saw the handwriting on the wall. And he really, before there was even the vote for impeachment, he walked away. He resigned because he knew the vote, votes were there for impeachment. And once the impeachment was, was in place, he knew that he, he was going to be convicted of the charges against him. So he walked away. Uh, Andrew Jackson, back in 1868, did not walk away. Uh, he was impeached, but he was acquitted of the charges against him, too. So... For Clinton, I mean, it really initially was a crapshoot for him as to whether or not he was going to be acquitted of the charges. And then, you know, the scuttlebutt became that that there were n numerous Republicans who were not significantly conservative, who were moderate, uh, moderate uh, Republicans, who did not want to see the removal of a, of a sitting president and didn't believe that the charges that were brought against him really were high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, and so in the Senate, he was acquitted because 
even though the initial impeachment charges were, you know, high crimes and misdemeanors, there really was this significant discussion of did he really perjure himself? And if any of you have seen the tapes from the the deposition that that he did, where all of these perjury charges stem from, um, he really is a, a master of language or so, and also of of sort of wiggling out of things. And this is where we get that that joke that people always talk about. Well, you you have to what what's the what's the definition of is right? Um, and so for for him, it really is this this period of time where again like I said it's a crapshoot for him but it's a period of time where he really decides to take the risk of you know sort of being what what people have um, somewhat affectionately for some and, and for others they obviously really dislike the term um, he gets called slick willy because he's somebody who is always you know we talked about the Teflon president of Ronald Reagan but slick willy is the guy who can sort of you know worm himself out of of whatever problems that that uh, that he's facing so you know this idea of it depends upon what the definition of is is and so uh, for him it all comes down to semantics right it all comes down to you being able to pin something on him well I you know I don't I don't see your the truth that you see is not the truth that I see and so he's very good at really talking his way out of things and in terms of the perjury charges after his impeachment, um, there are many senators, including Republican senators, who say that is what he did in the deposition is not perjury, and he didn't perjure himself. And many of them also, there are some who who suggest that later on, in later years after after the actual acquittal, that really come out there and say, you know, he he might have been. He, he very well might have been strictly guilty in terms of the issue of, of perjury, and we allowed him to sort of wiggle out of it, but we really didn't want to impeach a sitting president, or, or, or remove, rather, a, a sitting president. Like, the impeachment was the the sort of the slap, you know, the slap on the, on the hand to say, don't do this again, but we didn't want to remove a sitting president. And so they, uh, uh, many of them, in terms of the Republican Party, also decide um, to 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 vote against his his removal because of that. So there's that in terms of what I have here on the screen: the downfall of Bill Clinton. That's the downfall of Bill Clinton, right? When he leaves the presidency, he actually has high approval ratings. That often happens with with presidents as they leave, even when they're presidents that people don't necessarily um, like or who have had scandals. When they end up of uh, finishing up their term there's again you know this idea of nostalgia and thinking back on the on the presidency and there was a lot by the time we hit uh 1999 2000 there was a lot again this nostalgia was going on culturally and socially but you also had people who were thinking back to the hope of the initial initial uh years of the Clinton presidency and so that's something that they nostalgically um, discussed as well and really that that's something that pushed up his uh, his approval ratings as well okay also a main theme of the uh, the 1990s would be race and another one would be gender um, your book talks a little bit about the idea of identity politics um, and identity politics obviously being that that you know political issues become much more um, focused on race focused on gender focused on sexual orientation and things like that um, and so it's bantied about this this particular term um, often in, in a in a negative uh, sense but there are a lot of identity politics that are going on in, in the 1990s um, and we have racial and gender issues that again as we've mentioned before a lot of these are things that are that are being worked on incrementally like discrimination in the workplace as we talked about in the in the 70s and the 80s but we also know that there are still a lot of of uh, uh, disparities and in inequities in terms of uh, economics um, not just in terms of gender so the wage gap between men and women but also in terms of race right that not every person who is african-american benefits from anti-discrimination laws they don't always benefit from the uh, um, the uh, uh, quotas that are at um, higher education institutions. Um, they don't always benefit from these things that they supposedly benefit from all the time, right? You have to actually have the ability to go to college. You have to have gone to, you know, the right school to go to college. Um, you have to have the um, 
the financial uh, ability to at least make the choice to go to college. You could get a scholarship, but you always have to have that backing, right? So not every African American, um, not every Mexican American is going to be able to make these choices. So you have significant inequities in terms of, of uh, secondary education. You have significant inequ inequities in terms of uh, whether or not parents can pay or you can pay to go to college or even go to community college, right? So not everyone is going to benefit from anti-discrimination laws or not everybody is going to benefit from racial quotas. Um, it's just not going to be something that, that, you know, college might not even be on uh, certain uh, minorities, their radar. It's just not going to be there. Um, this is a socioeconomic issue as well as a racial issue, but it's something that, that's there, right? So a lot of these inequities that, that occur um, are really going to be the things that, you know, all, all of the issues that have come up in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and all of the leveling out that supposedly is taking place, that it illustrates, you know, how deep these issues are because even with acts of trying to level things out, things can't be 100% leveled out and nothing can be perfect, right? And so in terms of the 1990s, we really see with the same issues that we are discussing today, police brutality issues or uh, police discrimination against African Americans. And this is something that happens in the early uh, 1990s with the uh, beating of Rodney King, who you see here on the screen. Um, and somebody actually was filming uh, this beating and the, uh, um, the officers who were uh, involved in this were identified and they were put on trial for it and they were acquitted in the spring of 1992. And when they were acquitted, there were significant riots throughout Los Angeles. And so the LA riots illustrated to Americans that the racial issues that they had pretended had gone away were really still all there. They just didn't actually focus on them all the time, or they actually weren't connected to them in any way. They didn't hear about them. They didn't live the same um, life. They didn't live in the same communities as African Americans. And so they didn't see all of the same things that African Americans did. They didn't have to make the same choices that African Americans did, or Mexican Americans, or Asian Americans, or even women in low low socioeconomic status, regardless of their of their uh, their race or ethnicity. So the LA riots really pointed to that, um, and really illustrated to America that that racial issues may have gotten better, as I've talked about, very, vastly different from the 1960s to the 1990s, but the things still needed to be worked on and these incremental changes that we had made and we had sort of swept things under the rug and like I mentioned you know we have these underlying currents in terms of people working on these issues to make incremental changes it really illustrates to people that maybe we need to work a little bit harder and this is where I get this idea of, of the culmination of things that happened uh, things that were brought up in the 1960s in terms of race and gender and even sexual orientation and those things being somewhat hammered out in the 1990s because the LA riots bring everything to the forefront again. And so people understand that there's a significant difference between the 1960s and the 1990s, but they know that things can be better. And so this is a point in time when people actually work on this. Do they get 100% better? Obviously not. We know that as living in the 21st century, and especially in the 2010s, some of the really significant things that have happened in the last couple of years in terms of race. But we also see that there's significant, there's significant strides. Again, the election of Barack Obama. The uh, um, the fact that that uh, um, even though there's still a wage gap, a salary gap for women, that there are more women who are who are um, the the CEOs of companies. There are more women who are the presidents of companies. There are more women who are business entrepreneurs. Right. Um, you also have uh, um, significant changes in terms of how people look at at individuals who were of different sexual orientations. So we have all of these things that, that you know have incrementally changed between the 60s and the 90s and then we have things that have incrementally changed between the 90s and say the 2010s. So you can really see that a lot of the issues of the 60s even though they were not a full culmination in the 90s that many things had changed and just 
things needed to continue to be worked on as they do today. If you think about how ingrained a lot of these issues are, clearly it's going to take a very long time to to r root all of them out, right? To get rid of all of these these uh, um, issues, to get rid of prejudice, discrimination, all of these things are going to be pretty pretty difficult to get rid of. And then you obviously have a lot of issues that are happening today where we're sort of trying to you know figure out how to bridge the gap here in terms of, of what is uh, racial behavior and what is behavior that's actually being levied against people uh, simply because of their own personal behavior as opposed to their race or their ethnicity or their gender or their sexual orientation. So it's a navigation that we're, that we're doing now um, that really I think is, is, um, is an important one, uh, but it's also something that, that starts to get very muddied, right? And so you have some pretty, pretty. We have very heady issues that we're that we're talking about in 2015. But we can still look at the vast differences between the 1960s, the 1990s, and the 2010s. And again, I'll bring it up again. So we have things like Ferguson that are going on, and yet we also have an African American president. So you can see that there's a significant disparity there, but there's also a significant difference between you know that was not the world of the 1960s. The idea of having an African American president wasn't even there on the on the radar for African Americans the idea at that point was to get civil rights to get the ability to vote even though they had the right to vote to get the ability to vote to be able to 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 actually v register to vote the way a white American would you know and so this is you can see the vast changes and the vast differences. So again, I don't believe in the post-racial society, but I absolutely believe in the idea that the things are vastly different than they were in, say, 1965. Okay, another main theme of the 1990s is the internet, the rise of internet uh, uh, information technology, rather, and then the the proliferation of the internet in American homes and that's really what we what we see here in the late 1990s is you know information technology has been around for a while it's been in corporations for for quite a while but for it to make its way into American homes that by the time you hit 97 and 98 that at the very least middle class and upper class homes that it is quite normal to have an internet modem in your house. Um, that by 2000, uh, we have different technology in terms of being able to connect to the internet. Um, and we buy, you know, 2005, it's completely different. Um, you have between the late 1990s and say 2005, that the, uh, the ability to have internet in your home has become uh, something that that almost anyone can have uh, because it becomes such a such a, a economical thing to have in your home it costs a lot more money in 1997 to have it in your home than it did in does say in 2015 also in terms of of computers it costs a lot less money to have a computer in your home now than it did in 1997 so there are some economic differences in terms of being able to allow everyone to have some form of access to, to the internet and some form of access to information technology. But my point here is that in the late 1990s, there were a good chunk of Americans, especially in the middle class, who gained access to the internet. And that's how our communication process has changed. That's how eventually we started, people People actually started using the World Wide Web in order to, to get news, um, to, to figure out what was going on with the stock market, with weather, um, using e email all of the time, starting to use chat rooms. Like these are things that, that we think of today, even some of the ways that people did this were quite primitive in the late 1990s. But it is the start of this complete revolution in terms of how we communicate with each other, how we communicate with the world, how we deal with the world, how we shop, um, you know, how we learn. Uh, everything is different now, right? So obviously this is something that, that bubbles up in the late 1990s. Uh, we also have globalization and globalism. Um, so the idea of, of globalizing um, the, the world, creating one very particular, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, or I guess not an oxymoron, but like the same thing, right? But globalization, globalizing the world, really is this idea of creating you know, one particular uh, universal culture, 
one particular universal economic system, right? So it's like internationalism. And so the idea here is to create a global community that is interconnected with, with itself. So say between the United States and say, say Germany, that there's this interconnectedness in terms of our economics, in terms of our ability to communicate with, with each other, in terms of culture, in terms of, I would say, particularly capitalism, right? Because capitalism is what's going to spread, especially in, in Germany, especially in East Germany, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after a lot more relaxation of any sort of tensions in the 1990s and the reunification of Germany. This is when you're going to see capitalism really, really go full force into Germany and this is going to be how you know how do the rest of the countries in the world become a part of the international economy well they connect themselves to in the United States so the idea of globalization is that the United States would be the global leader of an economy of politics and then also of a very very general global culture that is pretty much based in American culture, but it is one very universal culture. And we see that. It's not that we've seen the wiping away of, of other cultures, but other cult other uh, countries in the world, their culture has really somewhat depleted in terms of mainstream culture and everyday life. That it's still there and that they still obviously um, are highly connected to their personal culture, but in their daily walking life, they have a greater connection to the rest of the world. And that obviously stems as well from the internet, but it also stems from this concerted effort that the United States put in, in terms of the idea of globalization and the interconnected nature of economics, the interconnected nature of politics, and the interconnected nature of, of culture. And so, uh, um, if you travel, if you travel abroad, you can really see that there are two different cultures that are operating, two, two sort of mainstream cultures that are operating at the same time. There's the country's mainstream culture and then there's the global culture that's operating within the country. And I think it's very interesting and I know there are very, very many people who are against it. I'm not necessarily against it unless it, it completely destroys the individual cultures of people because obviously those are extremely important things and they should, not only should there not be like, the world should not be universally American, um, but people have their own religious traditions, their own cultural traditions, their holiday traditions, their familial traditions. And so those are things that are obviously very sacred. So we don't want to break those down. But we also have the idea that we do live in a very interconnected world. And there's going to be a, a world culture that emerges from that. And as the United States being the leader of the world, obviously is going to have very significant traces and elements of Americanism in it, right? So the idea here for the 1990s is that this is where globalism really starts to, starts to crop up and creep up. This really is sort of the post- Cold War society and the cold, post Cold War international society, this idea of globalization, but it also connects very well to the idea of the internet and the the uh, um, the rise of an international community via the the internet. And then finally, a, a very significant theme that goes along with uh, the Harrison book is the digi digitization, excuse me, of music. Um, and we obviously know now in the 2000s and the 2010s that that digital music is clearly something it not only changes as Harrison talks about it not only changes how music sounds but it also changes how music is spread throughout the world and obviously we have the creation of Napster which is the uh, um, the site where people would go to download music and they actually used to download it for free this is where we start seeing things like you know the ability to use YouTube to watch videos and not not actually pay for music or the creation of of music services eventually as well. So this is where we start seeing that crop up and obviously you would because of the rise of, of the internet. But you can see here that there are some very significant themes here in terms of the 1990s that are very different from themes in other um, in other decades that we've talked about. Um, so I want you to kind of kind of focus on these to recognize that these really are if you were to thread them together um, this really is the narrative of the 1990s. You know, Harrison talks about those four significant narratives. Those should be woven together, and these main themes should be woven into that as well. So that's basically your narrative here, okay? So um, let's skip ahead. Let's talk about um, 
my thesis for the 1990s, and then we'll talk about, you know, tying up some loose ends in terms of the broader issues of the course, which would be talking about the 1960s and the 19, to, through the 1990s as an era. So here's my thesis for the 1990s. And the bridge of the 1980s, which we've talked about in terms of, of, you know, trying to bridge the 70s to the 90s, the bridge of the 1980s led to a decade that in many ways fulfilled some of the hopes of the 1960s. However, racial, gender, and economic tensions continue to influence a decade that would serve as a period of transition, obviously that transition between the 20th century and the 21st century, that led the United States to a new century of economic prosperity, albeit cyclical economic prosperity, massive technological changes which would be for the world obviously and continued cultural amalgamation so the the 90s are, are really a significantly important decade in American history and a lot of historians do talk about the idea that maybe the 90s are too close to us but as you can clearly see and and again you know not the best book in terms of of being able to understand uh, the 90s by just picking up the book and reading it right it definitely is about culture um, but as you piece together this narrative between what you've seen in the video, what I've talked about, and especially in terms of the very long discussion on, on the main themes of the 90s, um, and then taking this book and weaving it together, you can clearly see how important the 90s are, even if you just see them as that transitional period, right? You don't even have to see it in terms of the, the, uh, um, the fulfillment of some of the hopes of the 60s, um, that you can really see the 90s as being this period of trying to bridge the difference between the 20th century and the 21st century and some of that still occurs in the in the beginning of the 21st century but i think for americans september 11th really stops us from from thinking of of us being in a transitional period right that we that we just you know go full steam ahead in the united states um and so it's it's something that that really this is why i kind of see September 11th and 2001 is really that that bookend of the of the uh, 90s that you really can see that that things change then that we aren't thinking about the same things that say we were you know in in August of 2001 um, that we aren't thinking of the same things that we were in 1999 and so you can really see that this period of time if September 11th wouldn't have occurred I'm sure that the early 2000s would be thought of this as well as this transitional period but because it did for Americans it really changes the course of their of their history and how we actually discuss history and so you can really see the 1990s as stopping there or transition rather as stopping there so the 90s really are this transitional period between you know the old and the new the past and the future and that being the present that's really really creating for people in the 1990s this this bridge this this transitional bridge to walk across into this new and 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 very scary um century that they're moving into not the decade but the century something so different and supposedly so and you you know we we very rarely even though we celebrate each year and we move into the next year often many of us are like yeah it's a new year okay you know like the calendar's changing but what's really changing but in terms of centuries and especially in terms of the millennium humans do think in terms of the calendar in that sense like we're moving to this new this new era and so moving from that old era for americans in terms of the american century and then what's there on the other side right is is america going to uh, maintain its status um are we going to fall you know is the quote unquote empire going to fall um, and so that's scary for Americans and you can think about it when you're studying other uh, countries histories you can see how they deal with this as well and on a human level again you have that millennium fear right that idea that as we move into this new era um, that it's really going to be something that that is is scary for people who have biblical understandings of the world or who believe in folklore about the end of the world that there that there's going to be significant fear about that but you can really see between centuries and then again the millennium you can really see that human beings really 
really can can sort of see a change, right? They understand the change very much, very different in terms of the calendar year changing. Very different from you know the end of this year when we move into 2016. You know, oh, we moved into 2016. But when people move from 99 to 2000, they recognize that that century difference. They recognize the difference in the millennium. And so it really is an era for, and again, I'll focus specifically on Americans here, considering we're doing contemporary America. It's such an important transitional period because of the fact that the 1900s were so stunningly important for the United States. And so I think that's really what the 1990s are about for the United States, about for United States history, right, is this idea of transition, some fulfillment of hope, um, many things that still need to change, but transitional in terms of bridging the gap between these two centuries and then moving toward, you know, here we have the beginnings of massive technological changes and we have the continuation of cultural amalgamation. So we have all of these things that, that there's significant change, as Harrison talks about, but there's also this, this idea of, of, of trying to connect between the old and the new. And I think that's really, really important in terms of the 90s. So again, as I mentioned, many historians think, you know, we, it, we're too close to it. We're too close to it. You can clearly see that we're at the very least far enough away from it to recognize its transitional properties, right? That the 90s have significant transitional properties here. They have significant transitional elements. And they really are what bring us from that old century into the new and are able to, in the new century, connect ourselves back to the, the old century. And so it's a very important period of time. So now we're going to move on, and on our last slide here, we're going to talk about some of the connections that maybe you can make for yourself in terms of the course material um, and some connections that I kind of want to throw out there for you in terms of, of how to view this era between the 60s and the 90s. So here are the main threads that we have talked about in the contemporary era of American history. They're the main themes that we've talked about, but I like to talk about them as threads at the end of the course because you can really see how they sort of weave together, how you can connect them together between the period that we started looking at, the 1960s, and then our end point here in the 1990s. So number one, one of the main themes here obviously is the, uh, uh, the continued breakdown of discrimination and strife, racial, gender, and sexual preference issues, right? And again, not perfect by, by uh, um, the 1990s and not even perfect by today's standards. But we can see that breakdown, right? We can see the difference between how things were in terms of discrimination in the 1960s for all three of these issues versus how discrimination is in the 1990s. Or go back to opportunities in terms of women. What were women's opportunities in 1965 versus women's opportunities in 1995? Vastly different. So that's one of those those threads, you know. And you can talk about this in in uh, advancement, and you can also talk about it in terms of ways that that it had yet to change by the 1990s, right? But there's significant difference here. Um, also, racial and cultural diversity. Um, think about it in terms of, of music, right? So in the 1960s, there's a smattering here and there of African-American artists, or say somebody um, like Richie Valens, who is, who is representing Latinos. Um, there is not a lot of, you know, you don't typically turn on the television in 1965 and see an African-American artist. You see, you know, nine white artists and one African-American artist. But by the time we get to the 1990s, think about the fact that rap and hip-hop are the two number one mainstream styles of music, right? I mean, hip hop in the in the early 1990s. I mean, that if you turned on popular radio, that was all you were going to hear, with a little bit here or there with with a a a white artist, right? It was it was top 40 radio in the early 1990s. I think a lot about like say somebody like like Will Smith. September 1990, you have the uh, uh, the premiere of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Now, 
he was a rapper. He was uh, um, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Um, so he was a rapper. He was somebody who was, you know, not necessarily somebody who, he wasn't a hardcore rapper, um, but he was somebody who bridged that, that gap between rap and, and hip hop, right? Next thing you know, he has, he has his own television show. He's coming into the homes of millions of Americans, as is not only African American culture in a very specific way, um, but also hip hop culture, right? And so you see that coming into people's homes day in and day out. And the next thing you know, hip hop has permeated the culture even more, the mainstream culture. So you can see the significant difference racially. And I always use, in terms of music, I tend to use African Americans because you can see the vast difference between the 1960s and the 1990s. But you can also see it in terms of, of Latinos, but you see it more so after the year 2000, I would say, with, with Latinos. But you can see how there is significant racial and cultural diversity um, and I mean that in terms of, of uh, very specifically the entertainment industry, right? Or when you turn on your television at night and you would watch the nightly news. Now, the three main anchors of the nightly news by the 1990s were still were still white. But you have, you know, every time you would turn that on, if you're watching Tom Brokaw, here's a person who's African-American who's, who's doing a, a news story. Um, here's somebody who's filling in for, for Tom Brokaw who's African-American. So you would not have seen that uh, in, in uh, the 1960s. There was one particular uh, man in the 1970s who became a, a huge um, uh anchor on ABC and I'm, I'm totally blanking on his name at the at the moment but you saw like one person here and one person there or say women it took a long time for women to break into uh, to television news say somebody like Barbara Walters took her a very long time was on the Today Show um, and was basically doing weather and doing like you know slice of life pieces and then now she's th thought of as one of the greatest interviewers in the world right in modern memory so very, very different uh, uh, ways. Think of somebody like Diane Sawyer, who became the anchor of, of uh, ABC News, uh, Nightly News. So you see how there's very significant differences here in terms of diversity that comes through the entertainment industry, that comes through television news, that comes through literature. There is significant difference between 19, the 1960s and the 1990s. And I think hip-hop would be a very significant example of that. We also see cyclical power between the 1960s and the 1990s. So liberalism in the in the 60s, uh, conservatism mainly in the uh, uh, 1970s, with that little blip on the screen in terms of uh, uh, the 1970s rather in terms of. Uh, um, uh, Jimmy Carter. Then you move into the 1980s where you flip back to cons conservatism again and then we flip right back to to liberalism and Bill Clinton even though he's considered a centrist he obviously had a, a good um, a good following in terms of the liberal wing of the party and then also he had some very liberal ideas obviously especially with the issue of, of uh, um, sexual preference and the American military or universal health care when he first walked in the door of the of the White House. So very liberal issues, even though he presented himself as a as a moderate or a centrist uh, Democrat. So you see those those responses to to long term party dominance. OK, long term liberal dominance in the White House changes to conservative dominance. Then they try out out uh, Jimmy Carter for a little while, go back to conservatism and then right back to to at, at the very least centrist. Um, democratic policies, right? There's also the change in generational guard, which we obviously saw that at the beginning of our course with, with uh, uh, JFK. But think about it in terms of the 1990s, right? The significant change in terms of, of generations with Bill Clinton and, and thinking about the idea that, again, he's the epitome of those people who came of age in the 60s. You know, all the things that he went through, and by the time we get to the 90s, the baby boomers are in the White House, okay? So a significant generational guard change change that's even greater than the one that we saw in um in 1960. Uh, then we also have the uh, the cyclical economic prosperity for the United States and even though we have economic downturns even though we had the recession that we had in terms of of the uh, the 2000s you also you can certainly see that for the United States if you look on the long durée here if you look at 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 going back into the 19th century, that the 20th century, particularly after 
certainly after the Great Depression, but particularly after World War II, you see that the United States is very typically at the top of the heap in terms of economic prosperity, right? We might have downturns, but they all, we always have the upswing again. We're always prosperous, even in those terrible times in the early 1990s when people were, were losing their jobs, and many people actually lost their careers in the early 1990s you actually see that economic prosperity comes back very quickly. And even when people are doing poorly in the United States, they're not doing obviously as poorly as other countries within the world. So cyclical economic prosperity is really important in terms of the 60s through the 90s. And obviously that stems from the significant economic pickup for the United States after World War II. But we can see that the United States continues on that, that edge of, of constantly prospering economically and then having a quick downturn and then coming back, right? And then finally, we have the importance of consumerism. And we started out the course with Farber's book in terms of, of the, uh, the marketplace, right? And then eventually the marketplace of ideas. But you can see how consumerism is still so important in the 1990s that there's even a commodification of things that we wouldn't necessarily see as being, being commodities, sometimes even in terms of people, right? And I talked about this in terms of artistry. Uh, when when uh, um, you read the, uh, the section that I have on music in the, in the 1990s, that that really there's a commodification of the artist that occurs. There's going to be you know this significant focus on consumerism when uh, when the internet um, comes into Americans' homes. One of the first things that become other than like you know, reading the newspaper online or emailing people, the next big thing obviously is shopping online. Consumerism is highly important, right? And that's obviously what continues to drive our economic prosperity because many of us obviously do this on credit too. So it allows for us to be a part of the economic cycles, a part of economic prosperity, um, even though we might not always have that, that uh, um, money in our pocket to be able to do it. So you can really see, again, this is a significant theme. I bring up credit cards. It's a significant theme of the 1960s, right? So I want you, there's obviously many, many more of these that we could talk about, but I want you to kind of be able to, to recognize these as the base, basic ones, and then you guys can, can really um, connect to the other issues that you've seen because many of us see other things in the works that we've read right many of you might have picked on more political issues many of you may have picked up on more social issues some of you maybe even picked up on psychological issues throughout. So whatever it is that you're picking up, just make sure that it's a significant theme that you have seen throughout these these decades, right? They may wax and wane a little, but think about it in terms of, of the the this this era of contemporary American history, right? So I want you to be able to uh, to uh, um, figure some of these things out for yourself, right? To see those things that kind of pop out to you as you've been reading these books. I'm sure there are many of you who've had one particular theme that you've just been able to pick out in every single book, and I haven't even talked about it, right? So recognize these as the main themes, but not the only themes that, that you can talk about. Um, and again, this might be a way that you could, could uh, structure your final assignment, that you would talk about themes as opposed to chronology. But however you want to do that is fine by me, and we'll talk about that in our discussion of the actual assignment. But if you are going to do the assignment in terms of themes, these could be some of the themes that, that you, um, you pick out. So many of you obviously are wondering why I have this somewhat creepy picture of Bill Clinton here. This is actually his Twitter picture, um, but I just kind of like see him looking at me going, I feel your pain, you know. So I think it's a really, really uh, funny picture, um, but I wanted you to kind of, you know, recognize Bill Clinton as being sort of the icon of this era that we've talked about, you know, really kind of be able to see his life as being this, this stretching from what his life was in the 1960s and then stretching it along to the 1990s. And it really is this, this story of, you know, someone who came of age and then by the, in the sixties and then by the time he gets to the 1990s decides to, whether you, you like the guy or not decides to, in many ways, give back. Um, even though he, uh, um, gained a great deal from being president, especially in terms of his ego, he absolutely, Absolutely gave back and this was something that is a part of the baby boomer generation right the people who came of age in the 1960s who were the children of the men who went uh, into World War two that these are the people who eventually ran the world in the 1990s and this for the United States it's really important that in the 1990s we had such a young president that really again that change in generational guard so I really see him as symbolic representative of the 
things that we have have talked about both positively and negatively as well um, so this is basically the end of our course right um, and I want you guys to be able to as you move into your final assignment your final essay for me to really be able to see that there are so many different threads between these decades and there's a reason why contemporary America obviously ends in terms of the 1990s right we could have stretched it into the 2000s and we could have stretched it certainly to 2001 but in terms of continuity and in terms of significant changes these are the decades the 60s the 70s the 80s the 90s this is where we see again you know we walk across into the 21st century from this era and so I think it's one of the most important eras of American history um, most people would say yes of, of modern American history I say no of of all American history it's a very significant uh, portion of time um, and particularly um, those six significant social and cultural changes that we see between the 60s and the 90s um, really signify why it's such an important period of American history. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, um, the course. I certainly enjoyed teaching it. Um, it's really, uh, I think it's very fun material uh, when you're not talking about uh, the, the uh, significant issues and problems in terms of race and gender and, and things like that. But it's really fun in terms of being able to see, you know, how we could connect again this 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 idea of looking at a period of time that can connect so well to the longer term past and then connect so well to the present day that we're in and so I really think that it's it's really an important bridge between those two and again I think it's just a, a, a really wonderful period of time where you can see where there was great hope um, that maybe faded and waxed and waned but eventually a great deal of that that hope came to fruition um, so again I hope you enjoyed the course I certainly enjoyed teaching it take care